Good morning, I'm Jonathan Humphreys, crime reporter at the Liverpool Echo. I'm joined by Adam Everett, our Crown Court reporter. Hello. So I'm delighted to welcome Detective Superintendent Mark Baker and Detective Chief Inspector Jude Blees to our offices today. Uh, DS Baker and DCI Blees led the investigation into the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell, which of course most of you will know is one of the highest profile cases in the forces history, in the history of Merseyside Police. And as any regular reader of the Liverpool Echo will already know, Olivia, just nine years old, was shot in the place she was entitled to feel safest, her own home, on August the 22nd last year. Thomas Cashman has been convicted of a murder after a trial at Manchester Crown Court and jailed for life with a minimum of 42 years behind bars earlier this month. Now, DS Baker and DCI Blees have kindly agreed to come to, our, uh, come to the Echo today, discuss how they worked on the case and what it was like to, to be involved in that investigation. I'm delighted to welcome you both here today. Um, yeah. So firstly, could you take us back to that dreadful night, August the 22nd? Um, when did you first hear that a nine-year-old girl had been had been shot and killed? And, and what was going through your mind? And, and when did you first realise that you that would be your case? Yeah, good morning. Um, it was Tuesday, the 23rd. I was at home. And I took a phone call from our assistant chief constable, uh, Chris Green. He rang me and said that uh, a nine-year-old girl been shot dead the night before in Dovecott and then um, I couldn't believe it, so he shocked. I couldn't believe this would happen here in Liverpool. Of course this was already quite a, um, a significant week wasn't it with the murders of Sam Rimmer and Ashley Dale? That's right, that's right, yes. I'd, um, I'd been involved with the Ashley, uh, sorry, the Ashley Dale murder as well, I was actually involved in that in the initial stages. Um, so it's been a really busy weekend, obviously Sam was shot uh, the same week. So it was high, three high-profile murder investigations within quick succession. Um, but this, you know, nine-year-old child shot in her home it was a significant moment, really. Um, I suppose from my point of view as a senior investigating officer, I felt proud that I was being asked to lead the inquiry. Um, you clearly question yourself, are you good enough um, as an SIO? Uh, and looking to see which team we would pull together and obviously that's when Jude and her team made a crime unit within um, the Operational Command Centre and Speak took ownership of the investigation. And Jude for you? Well. Um, I was actually away from home. I knew my syndicate and I were due to pick up the next murder because we have to be sadly proactive about these things. We need to make sure that we've got those measures put in place and I watched it unfold on the on the telly um, as probably the nation did, um, trying to fit the pieces together at what had actually happened. Um, and it was horrific to watch. Um, and I obviously made some inquiries, but I knew the team were going to be really busy. So you don't want to pester, you want to make sure that they're left to, to deal with things. Um, starting with um, a major investigation is always difficult and I knew everybody would be running around frantically trying to get, sort of make sense of what had gone on. Um, so um, I made contact with the team and then I hit the ground running, I think, on the Thursday when I got back. Um, Can you just give us a flavour of, of, of what it's like in those very, very early stages of a major murder inquiry like that? What, what are the first things that are, are crucial for you to do as a team and, and how do you get, sort of, get everything running and up and running? Well, I think, like I said before, we always try and be a little bit proactive. Um, we try and work out who has got capacity to pick up the next job. Um, we already have our key roles in place, generally speaking, so we know who's going to pick up those roles. And it's really important because with any job like this, you are going to hit that ground running. Um, so we need people that have got that skill set that are able to almost work um, independently without supervising um, to allow then the management team to, to build on the major investigation room um, and it's all hands to the pump. Um, we are an extremely um, dedicated and um, our skills and abilities around MIRs, um, you know, that they're sort of bred within the team, we know what we're doing. 
Um, but in my 31 years service, I have never ever seen an investigation to the size of this one. Um, and I've worked on a lot of murders over my years. Um, you know, Alice Rye and um, Barker and G all those years ago. And I've never ever worked on a murder with such complexities and the amount of information and the volume of, um, of things coming in. This was a kind. Of, this was a murder investigation that was big. If we can use that word in a, in two different ways, wasn't it? You talked about the complexity of the case itself, but also the huge media interest in it. What, did that sort of affect your mindset at all? Did was it was it difficult to tune out some of the yeah, initials? Yeah. Uh, straight away, recognising what it was was really important. As Jude just said, there, selecting key roles from investigation points of view was really important. For me, as always, is about making sure we've got the right family liaison officers in place and making sure they've got the right skills, um, which we did. That was the priority for the first day. Because we'd had two previous murders, we were, I was anxious as the senior investigating officer to see where the detectives were going to come from to support the investigation um, and where we were going to work as well because the two high profile cases and resources that needed to support that, that, that was bothering me. Uh, clearly, we did a press release the first thing in the morning, Chief Constable, um, Serena Kennedy, uh, appealing for witnesses to come forward uh, with Mark Kameen, uh, the Detective Chief Superintendent, Head of Crime. We very quickly were being inundated with information from the community. This is exactly what we wanted. So putting the structure in place was really, really important to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Um, we got off to a really good start because the investigation was well investigated on the night. So when I came in on the, the, the Tuesday morning, the night detective uh, team had done an exceptional job, job in sealing the area and reassuring the community. We put the mobile police station very, very quickly. And that was important because we knew the community were going to be anxious. So those key messages from into the media were critical to us. And as a force, you know, we recognised this, we'd experienced in dealing with cases like this, we knew that not just local media, there'd be national media interest in the, in the investigation. Of course. I think you, <clears throat> sorry, I think you mentioned there briefly, obviously being inundated with the uh, with information from the community, and um, I think in particular you'll you'll have people who you'd, you'd never expect ordinarily to come forward with with information or or names. I mean, does that just give you sort of a sense of perspective in the case and like just how? appalling a, a, a crime it was that these people were coming forward and speaking to you? It does, uh, and that was really, really important. We, that was the key appeal point. We felt that people involved in criminality would know about what had gone on or the reasons why um, the Chief Constable directly appealed to people with that information to come forward. We felt because of the circumstances uh, in which the murder had unfolded, it had gone wrong, clearly Thomas Cashman was always intending to kill Joseph Nee, but probably wasn't intending to have to chase him into a house. Um, we knew that there'd been a shout inside the house and he continued to shout. So we felt that a mistake had been made and therefore we hoped that somebody would come forward with some information to assist the investigation. Um, and we always do. But that was a key appeal point for us during the initial phase that we were looking for people involved in crime that don't normally trust the police to come forward um, and, and support us because that line in the sand, if you like, had been crossed. Mm. Um, and, and, and that was really important, not just through the local work we were doing in the, the media, but talking to the community. And that's why I mentioned local policing, partnership working we were doing and briefing as many people as we could to make sure that those key messages around supporting potential witnesses um, was in place. Mm. And how soon was it then that you, you, you had the name Thomas Cashman in, in relation to the investigation? Well, people were talking about lots of names in the community around Dovecott quite quickly. Uh, clearly, there was feuding in the area um, and we were keen to pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. So although his name was one of the first that was mentioned, other people were also being named as well. Um, it's important for us as investigators to ensure that we keep an open mind and pursue the evidence. So the real focus for us during the first week, if I could say that, was to make sure that we maximised evidence collection around the scene. Um, 
locking the scenes down and collecting, preserving CCTV, identifying key witnesses, people that actually saw what went on. You, know, you will know through the course of the trial that we read a lot of statements out from key witnesses. Now making sure they felt comfortable and safe was really important and it was really important to us, the investigation team, that the people that were going out talking to these witnesses were listening in relation to what was being said and we built in trust and confidence um, and that wasn't just the detectives, it was all of the uniform and partnership support. Mm. Well, was it difficult getting those witnesses to sort of speak about their experience given such a traumatic incident? There's obviously quite early on it, it, it looks as though serious organised criminals have been involved. Was there a sense of fear? Was the trauma that they'd experienced just seeing the, the shooting take place and, and hearing the screams afterward? Did that make it difficult to, to gather that evidence? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Go on. I, I think it's, um, it's always difficult to get witnesses to come on board. Um, I think the communities of Dovecot should be really proud of themselves because they have stepped up. Um, they've stepped up, they've provided us with the information. Um, and I know Mr Baker's talking there about pulling the evidence together, but you've got to balance that against all of the other information that's coming in, um, evaluating it to see if it's credible, if it's misinformation. So there was a lot going on. And you've got to build the confidence with the community that they're being listened to as well. So when we get those witnesses on board is identifying who is the best person to speak with them, um, using the skills of the team to, to speak with those individuals, but then have that liaison with them. Um, they're things that we've done in the past in previous investigations and it works. So it allows them to have that single point of contact. They're able to then build up their confidence because we need these witnesses. We need them to come on board with that investigation but we need to also give them that reassurance that we're going to look after them through that process. So can you, can you give us a bit of a sense of, so the, we, we obviously on the, on the Monday night, this, this terrible incident's happened. Um, you start to get the initial sense of, of how it's gone down. And then what, what are the next steps? When did you start to sort of the picture of, of who was involved and how it, had, it all unfolded? When did, that, when did that start to become clear in your minds? Um, and did you see any immediate difficulties with, with how the investigation was going, to, uh, was going to progress? So if you describe it, it's been an extremely complex investigation. What, did, what was your first impressions of the, of the job, if, if you like, and, and how you were going to go about it? I'll take that, yeah. I think uh, straight away it looked as though it was a well-planned job. Um, you know, Jude's mentioned she's got 31 years experience, and I've got 29, so between us, maybe 60 years experience in policing, plus lots of experience around us as well. Um, some of our investigators are just superb. Uh, and we talk about it as a team, but because the, 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 straight away we could see there'd been an element of planning. Um, and these jobs are notoriously difficult to investigate. So CCTV was a priority for us very, very early on. Jude mentioned witnesses. Trust doesn't happen overnight, you know, you need to get to know people. You can't just turn up and say, trust us, we're the police. That doesn't happen. Um, it doesn't happen in life, does it? You need to deliver on promises and deliver on pro and not overcommit yourselves and use the right people that understand the legislation uh, that you can set witness witnesses with as well. Um, so that was really important, building up the picture, taking statements from people. Lots of witnesses were fearful, as you say, because you could see straight away it was organised crime. It's a shooting in the street, in a public place, people were really, really anxious. Um, so working to try and make people feel more confident. I listened to what they were saying. So lots of information came in around drugs and the like, around criminality in a local area. And we went on the front foot as a force to execute warrants. Uh, we were chasing the guns that we knew had been used very, very early on. Um, we still haven't recovered those two guns that we, that we used in the murder. Clearly one of the appeal points today would be for anybody with any information to come forwards and tell us where, where they are to stop them ever being used again anywhere else in the country. Um, so the initial focus was around supporting key witnesses that had seen what had gone on, and making sure that we could um, get what they'd seen in evidence. Um, and we knew full well there was quite a lot of anxiety. Yeah. And that was a priority for us really, and making sure that we worked really, really hard by listening to local people, local 
uh, councillors, um, people who are quite well known in the community, shops and shopkeepers gathering their CCTV, and then we obviously started to build up a picture in relation to where the offender had gone. Um, you know, basic police in some respects. How's he got there? How's he got away? Where's he gone to? Um, and that must have been quite a formidable job because once a case gets to trial, the CCTV has been analysed. You've got the bits that you're interested in, uh, any bits the defence is interested in. If they've got that, but it must take a very long time to process all that and get the get to the relevant bits. Can you just talk us through how that's done and, and how many people are involved? I'll start. I mean, it, <laughs> it takes. Uh, we collected uh, 315 items of CCTV. We would say, from an investigation point of view, we collected every item of CCTV available across Dovecot. Now, you can imagine the effort that took. Um, some people voluntarily provide the CCTV, others were fearful. Um, so, to overcome that, we applied to the magistrate for the warrant to go and seize that CCTV. And that's us as police investigating our fear or favour, really. Um, and pulling that together and reviewing it took hours and hours and hours. Um, we pulled in resources nationally because we'd had two previous murders. We went to something that's known as mutual aid, which meant we asked for detectives from across the UK to come and work in Merseyside. And we were lucky as a team. Mm -hmm. We were blessed with some exceptional detectives from across the country that came up and stayed in Liverpool uh, for a considerable period of time and they assisted us. Um, and that was hard for them because they're not from Merseyside and um, walking around doing house to house inquiries when you're from down Devon Cornwall for example or elsewhere in the UK and integrating them into our team I think was a particular challenge yeah. for us as leaders and um, supervisors and making sure they felt comfortable and we listened to the skills um, and experience they got really. Mm. It must have been quite daunting for them maybe to, to come from another force and join a, an, an investigation of this size and, and scope. I'd say it was. Uh, they all felt proud to be involved. They all wanted to come. They all recognised the significance of the investigation. And they, like everybody else involved in the investigation, put their lives on hold while they came up and assisted in the investigation. So I think from June and I's point of view, we'd like to take the opportunity during this to thank uh, those people that did that. Yeah. Because that's really important. Um, and plus the rest of the investigation just absolutely phenomenal. I know Jude and I as SIO and Deputy SIO were extremely proud of the work that was undertaken uh, to get to the situation where we were able to present the evidence in the best format possible through the course of you know, the recent trial. So, yeah, really complex. I think you, I think you said it was 315 cameras, was it, so that, you, yeah. that you looked at? And obviously you're looking over a a period of days from from those sorts of cameras. I mean, that, that the amount of time that that must just take for for for, for your officers to go through, and it's a pretty thankless task as well, isn't it? Just you're looking out for that one moment where this this figure in black's there, or I think there's there's times where he's in a blue t-shirt, for example, and you know you're looking out for those very few seconds moments out of hours of fo footage, aren't you? What I would say in relation to that, they prove in the negative is really really important. You know, from the police point of view and the prosecution perspective, it's really important that we rule out all the lines of inquiry. Where did that man go on the night? And, and showing that he didn't go here or he didn't go there, either before or after, is equally important. That's always pursuing every reasonable line of inquiry to make sure that whoever does stand trial, we know it was Thomas Cashman in the end, that we've prosecuted him fairly um, and that's really important as well for the community they can see that it's been done fairly and I, I, I think that's really really important that we were able to say to the defence we, we you know you tell us where you think your you know clients if you like or the defender was and we will show you what we've done to support that yeah and i think you question around how many hours i mean as much as there was over 300 pieces of cctv um some of them were potentially a month long so you're trying to then look to build up that picture um to find out and some of that obviously you saw um within the court setting what was shown there um and it's really hard and like mr baker says trying to prove and disprove 
um, finding those key pieces. But at that particular time, you don't always know it's a key piece. So you'd have staff reviewing a whole piece of CCTV, could be a whole day's worth. And then two weeks later, having to review it because further information has come in. And actually we're looking at the wrong person or we're now looking for a different vehicle. And it was all of that that we had to do. So sometimes those pieces of CCTV were viewed four or five times. Um, it was absolutely phenomenal. We had, um, it was almost like a factory. Um, that's the only way to describe it really. Um, the mutual aid staff that came over, and Mr. Baker's touched on it as well. You know, they were all in separate hotels. They were away from their family. Just the logistics of trying to get them together, trying to get them so that, you know, some of them came up in pairs, some of them came up on their own. Um, so it was really important important that we manage their their welfare their well-being in order to get them to be um able to deliver in what we needed them to deliver on um so it's very intense for them as well if they're you know, absolutely they're, they're, they're not able to unwind at any point and go, go off and see their families they're, they're literally going to work and then go into a hotel room and probably it doesn't leave their mind at any point and then they're back in the next morning and doing the, the exact same thing aren't they it was but as I say, in, in my 31 years service and all the murders I've worked on, and it's not to detract from anything that I've worked on before, I think it was just the amount and the volume. The amount of people that wanted to help, it was incredible. Um, absolutely incredible across the force and across other forces, across partner agencies, everybody wanted to help. So those officers looking at the CCTV, I mean, we just had a whole bank of, of staff literally CCTV all day long and that in itself is is a hard job keeping your eyes peeled for those vital pieces of evidence that we're looking for um, it, you know and then alongside that we've got your telecoms bank of you know staff you've got your um, your exhibits officers and then you've got all of your outside inquiry team it's huge um, and you can imagine the amount of information coming in for the management team um, was phenomenal, um, but yeah. I know I'm blessed as an SIO because that team is is fantastic, um, a fantastic team that works together and everybody wanted that same goal to find who'd done it. So obviously that's a hugely important strand of the investigation, you know, of course, then got to narrow things down and, and, and settle on a particular suspect. Um, and of course we heard in court there was a particular witness, the key witness she was referred to. We can't name her for legal reasons, but she was absolutely integral to this case. Can, can you just talk us through how she came into came to, came to be um, questioned by yourselves and and how important her evidence was, and how that and how that fitted in with with the inquiries you'd already made? Yeah. Um, Eyes, uh, and like I said, we'd hope from the outset we would get somebody like that coming into inquiry. The we were first notified on the Wednesday evening of relatively quickly, yeah. relatively quickly uh, like that. And it came through third party into the police. Um, we obviously made inquiries in relation to what we'd been told and we investigated it. We were checking the facts, but we were also pursuing other lines of inquiry at the same time. So I suppose it was important to keep an open mind, although we could see it was really promising if it was true. Um, because we were checking uh, and making sure that um, what we were being sold was right, which is equally important. Um, you know, let's make no bones about this. This was a really, really brave thing to do. Um, really powerful and really, really important part of the investigation. So we, we were pleased, to say the least, um, that they, they'd come forward and took that decision to, to approach us. Um, and then the investigation progressed uh, quite quickly, but because we were given such a lot of other information uh, and we were still trying to pursue the guns, we executed lots of warrants and did lots of searching in and around Dovecot. And that was important for us as well, because while we were in people's houses, we were talking to them and doing house to house and speaking to neighbours. And that's when we're building trust and confidence in the investigation to say, we are listening to you. We're responding to what you're saying. This looks like a feud between two groups of people, or two organised crime groups as we call them in the police, feuding as it turned out, potentially families that were involved. 
Um, but that was a real key moment in the investigation when that witness came forward and we worked really, really hard uh, to make sure that they, she felt reassured and that requires specialist skills to do that. Of course, just to recap, um, what the witness was telling you was, of course, that Thomas Cashman had, had arrived at her house in the hours after the murder, or yeah. not long after the murder, um, asking for a change of clothes. He, he woke her up in a bedroom. She, um, she she believes he came through the back door, and uh, he made significant admissions. Um, do you just want to uh, recap kind of how that, that must have been for you to hear? It must have been quite an electric moment in the investigation to hear that evidence put forward. It was. Um, we didn't know all that initially because the information provided didn't contain all that detail. But as the inquiry developed and we were told more uh, because people were fearful, um, it, it was a really, really powerful moment. Um, and he'd gone to her house to try and understand why that was. At that stage, clearly during the course of the trial, we subsequently found out in relation to the relationship they'd had between them. And the, provide an explanation. Did that kind of make it more compelling to you that they'd had such a, they'd obviously had um, a fling, I think she described it in court, or an affair, and did that make the evidence more compelling to you that she, she knew him that well? Uh, it did. Um, I also listened to the way she spoke about him. Um, it, it didn't sound as though she was, um, she was angry that he'd been to her house because of the circumstances that she found out what he'd done. Um, she also spoke about him quite caringly, mm. which was painful for her, yeah. painful for her and um, that rung true. Yeah. Um, you know, as people, which we all are, you, you could see what she was saying, there was some truth in it. Um, mm. And that became really important, really, that she was telling the truth. And she yeah. said herself, you know, during the first few interviews that we had with her, because probably less trust in the police, maybe because of other reasons, um, you know, she explained why she was fearful. She was fearful of him, and other people were saying that to us. They were saying we're fearful of him. Um, so trying to build that trust, at which point we spoke to the Crown Prosecution Service, because clearly they're a key partner in this. Um, Maria Cole, who we both spoke about previously, she was fantastic. We both worked with before. Uh, we trust each other. She's extremely competent. Um, and she came and we briefed her and listened to where we were, which was really, really important uh, phase of the investigation. Showing what we pieced together. Um, I think a, an interesting day was when we went out and we found out that two guns had been used. Um, we met up with the, the experts, Andre Villas Hall. Um, and I was quite surprised that two guns had been used, if I'm going to be honest, as the SIO. And um, I had heard of it previously. But that, for me, showed a real intent to kill. Um, and it's not something we see regularly. And when I found out that the, the Glock had been used to start with, and then it had been swapped to revolver, that told me that whoever had been involved in this had given this a lot of thought and was really determined to kill. And that was a key moment as well. And articulating all that information to the Crown Prosecution Service was really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think trying to get your head round, we had little bits of the CCTV at that point. We had Andre Horn telling us about two guns and you're trying to think, well, do, do they have a gun each and what, what's gone on and how's this, this all come about? And, and as it unfolded, you realised exactly what had gone on. Um, but that was something that really um, it probably heighten the investigation in, in so much as, as Mr Baker says, this was an absolute determination to kill someone, um, you know, and it mattered not who was in the way, um, that their pure focus and aim was to kill. And of course the way that the uh, that Cashman pursued me into the house of a total stranger, um, I think that the judge noticed, um, noted that he, he would have seen Cheryl Corbell, Olivia's mum, outside the house um, and saw her go back in and try to keep Joseph Neal and that didn't stop him firing blindly into the house. So he must have had a very, very desperate desire to kill Joseph Neal. I mean, it's, the no motive was put forward in court. Have you, have you ever come to any kind of um, conclusion as to, to why that was? 
Just before we answer that, we were quite shocked, weren't we, very early on when we recovered the CCTV from one of the key addresses. You could hear the gunshots. You could hear the first three, the glory, yeah, and then you heard the fourth fatal shot, and then you heard a scream. Now, we knew that whoever had fired that gun, we didn't know at that stage, must have heard somebody being seriously injured inside that house, and then continued to go inside the house to try to get in and then to fire that fifth shot. I think we were shocked when yeah, we, we fired were. that. Um, and you were talking before about you know, the emotion of the case. This was a highly emotive case for us all. Um, our emotions, the team, um, and the impact it had on them. We, when we were speaking to witnesses, they were breaking down, crying. That takes a big impact on the investigators, uh, as well as obviously members of the public who are reliving their experience. I heard in court that the neighbours performed uh, CPR on Olivia, didn't they? And, and obviously that witness wasn't needed to come in person, but you can just imagine how tough that would have, that conversation would have been. Unbelievable. Uh, and you know, what they went through that night, that local community, seeing and hearing that fear that caused. And then when the police have turned up, that, as you've heard, um, Constable Cooper picked Olivia up and took it to hospital now we've reviewed that i don't know of anybody that would have had the bravery to do that because that is some significant decision to make and um, it was the right one but whether and they're trained to do that our arm response officers but whether everybody else would do that i don't know um, that's such quick reason. thinking in like mm. uh, horrendous circumstances oh, you can't imagine unbelievable um, clearly we've seen footage <coughs> of what he did that mm. night um, and his partner and mm. taking Olivia to hospital and the work that went on there was you know incredibly distressing for everybody that saw it and even for staff that involved hospital staff for older hay um, and, and, and clearly well Cheryl couldn't be there because she was at hospital herself because she'd been shot through the hand but for the rest of the family and neighbours just something they will never forget for the rest of their lives um, which is, and this is what makes it an emotional case. It is, it's highly emotional. Um, and that's what we were concerned about. It, it is why I raised that, because we were concerned about our own staff. Um, we were concerned about staff that have come up from each way, because we don't know them uh, as well. But we do know through people we were speaking to, the impact it was having on them. Uh, um, yeah, horrible. It was, um, and, and going back to the CCTV, and it came out in court what we actually did with the the shots. So where you see the, those initial shots, um, where you visually see it, um, it was overlaid. So the camera with the audio of the actual shots was further away than you actually see. And that was why, um, you know, you hear that piercing scream that we were absolutely adamant that whoever had done it must have heard it, to then put an arm around a door knowing, I don't know who's in there, but I know a female's in there and I know a female is screaming. Whether they're screaming in pain, we would never be able to prove, but to just continuously try randomly shooting without seeing, um, for us just took it to that next level like we'd never seen. Um, so a dangerous man who's capable. Yeah. Absolutely was, you know, when we talk about that, it's almost like that red mist of it, 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 he did not care who got in his way. Um, he had an aim in his mind and he was absolutely determined. Um, he just didn't care, was reckless. And obviously, by the, when the witness came forward, she told you that she'd heard Cashman say, I've done Joey. Yeah. Um, and, and I mentioned something about... Joey had been sitting him off, as in watching him, yeah. um, as a potential reason why. What what picture have you built up of Cashman by that point? Was it was he already quite a significant suspect before she spoke to you? And and how much um, did you then decide to focus on him um, over other suspects potentially? Uh, he quickly became a key suspect because of what she'd said to us. Um, clearly, it won true. Um, we tested some of the, the accounts that we were given, particularly in relation to Paul Russell driving him away in the VW Golf 
They did some CCTV work around that. That was really important. Paul Russell has uh, pleaded guilty to assisting an offender, That's and he'll be due to be sentenced uh, later this month, isn't he? That's correct. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, quickly became uh, a, a key suspect, but equally we were still listening to the community, um, and, and other people were also arrested because we were pursuing reasonable lines of inquiry and making sure that the police uh, had done their job which is equally important, but we were starting to pick up golden nuggets around the investigation. Um, I mentioned the starting around CCTV, the route he took, you heard about him jumping gardens and going through that, and the, the route that he made his way when he fled the scene. That was really important for us, and tracking his movements. We, we released CCTV quite quickly, out into the public domain in relation to uh, a and he ran away, particularly on Bedford Corner, as became known during the trial, when he turned right there and then went through into Princess Drive. And that was really, really important. So there was little moments through the course of the inquiry where we could see you know, the case coming together. And like you say, it was a challenging one because there was no keys to witness who saw him and recognised his face. Forensically, there were some challenges there in relation to that. But once we got the account from the witness in relation to her saying that you know, she'd been asleep upstairs in the bedroom, he'd woken her, tapped her on the leg. Um, and sure enough, when we went and searched her house, she told us the back door was unlocked. The back door was unlocked. Um, so it, it, you know, we were cooperating everything that the witness was telling us. And you now know that to start with, she was arrested and brought into police custody and then the state has changed from becoming suspect to witness when we listened to what she'd got to say it was quite clear that she'd not committed any offences um, and that was an important moment yeah. and obviously with liaison with the Crown Prosecution Service and making that happen um, very tricky the fact that probably she hadn't told us the whole truth to start with made it quite challenging but on, on picking that and investigating that and trying to understand why that would be uh, these were real difficult challenges for us, weren't they, and the rest of the team. Um, thankfully, Maria was understood where we were um, and supported us in, in, in actually charging him eventually. He was arrested to start with and released back into the community. Mm. I think you know that in the course of the, the way the trial unfolded. At that moment in time, we didn't have the evidence to support the prosecution. Um, we would have liked to have charged him sooner. I think it was 42 days from the point of murder to the point of charge, which is a fast moving investigation. Myself and Johnny, we were just talking that before we came in, actually, like for, for the, such a complex investigation. I think um, it felt like longer in the time. Yeah, yeah, I think it did feel like longer when you're in the thick of it, I'm sure. But yeah. looking back, and it's just over a month from, from obviously the, the, the horrific event. Um, Olivia's ki killing un un until um, obviously Cashman is charged with a murder. Um, that, that's that's some progress, really, given given the size of the, the job you had and, and the fact that there was, you know, there's, there's probably n not one specific piece of evidence that that points to him being the culprit. Um, and uh, we were professionally really pleased with that position to be in. Um, relieved that we could go and see family go and see Cheryl and her family and John and tell him. Um, that was really rewarding for you and I, wasn't it? Yeah. With the, uh, and the team. I'm going back to the community and saying, listen, we've listened to you. You know, there were elements of the community that were saying, he gets away with things um, and you'll have difficulty charging him. Uh, I, I attended a community meeting the night before we arrested him for the second time. And people there were telling us that you know we've been riding around Dovecot the day of the Queen's funeral on a pedal cycle. Now that was quite important, really, because uh, from investigation point of view, we thought he was trying to intimidate potential witnesses by doing that. It was telling people in the community that he was still here and he was still out and about, um, and people that were considering coming forward to support the police may well have thought. I'll think yeah. about that. Yeah. I'm not so sure now whether I want to. So we were saying to the Crown Prosecution Service, we believe if we're able to charge him, there are other members of the community 
doubled Tustle's further. And that did happen. We went back to them and said, listen, he's in custody, he's out of the area, he's been charged, and he's done trial. Now we want further evidence from yourselves. And that happened, didn't it? Yeah. But, and, uh, had you got the sense he was feared in the community before this, with the reaction to of witnesses and, and people who were, were talking to you about him? Did, did you get the impression that they, he was a man that elicited quite a lot of fear in, the, in that particular area? I would say so, yes. Um, and I think the whole investigation team would agree with that. I think he um, had the community probably almost eaten out of his hand. Um, you know, sort of what he said went. Um, and it was obvious, as Mr Baker has described there, how we had, obviously, this witness coming forward. Um, you know, just one of the things that always sticks out in my mind is how she described him when he went round to the house, pulling us his hair, um, almost in that frantic moment, knowing that something's gone wrong, um, you know, and she did the right thing. She was very, very brave and came forward that allowed us to get to the position of charge. And then as Mr Baker says, you could see the community tensions and that feel of actually, you know, we've managed to get something back here. We've, we've got some control back um, and other people were willing to come forward then. Um, and that's exactly what we needed. Absolutely. And, and speaking about him being feared, we heard in court, albeit in the absence of the jury, that there were potential links to other unsolved killings years prior. And, and did you get any, uh, and, and I think that was something that was kind of in the community we're aware of, if I can put it that way. Was that something you think fed into that fear of him? That he was potentially linked to other serious, serious crimes? I think there's always going to be that, isn't there, with, with anybody. If, you, if you're fearful that somebody else has been responsible for something and then they've gotten away with it and then all of a sudden they're now believed to be responsible for that, it's always going to stop people from, from ever speaking to us. Um, what I will say with all of our murders that are unsolved, um, we have a serious case review team. Um, they, they go through... Um, so any pieces of information, any pieces of intelligence that come through, they will look at. If they feel there are viable lines of inquiry, they then get raised um, through to major crime then to have a look at. Um, so it will be interesting now that we're in a position whereby he's received 42 years of what information now comes in from the community that we can now have a look at. And can you, are you able to say whether there's any particular evidence that, uh, that's come up from the investigation so far that has been fed into other inquiries, other murder inquiries, as a result of uh, particular evidence that's come up as part of the, the investigation into Olivia's death. Oh, that's gone. Well, we, um, we're always appealing from any information. Um, what you get is sometimes community gossip. However, it doesn't matter what people think, it's about what people can prove. Um, what we would appeal for today, like we always do, is witnesses to come forward in relation to any investigation that we've got ongoing because um, that's what we always need so the longer was to talk about other cases really when we are still building trust and confidence in the community and we want people to talk to us about other criminality we do and, and that's the importance <clears throat> of, of these cases being solved and, and the offenders getting such long sentences well, isn't it that, that's, oh, that's that is a key point uh, you know 42 years what he's done sends a really powerful message out to anybody involved or considering picking up a gun. Let's be honest, this was completely reckless. Um, I genuinely believe that people will take note of that sentence. 42 years is huge and they've seen the way Merseyside Police, with partnership working, because it is, it's housing, it's health, it's schools, have built trust and confidence and we can be trusted and if you come to us with information we will look after you we'll treat you sensitively and there are lots of people in the community we've looked after during the course of this trial and continue to we don't just step away because the trial's finished we will be with these people for as long as they need us because that's how justice is served um, and that's a really really important message we feel from an investigation point of view that we're able to articulate that and get that known that we work really hard and you know we don't just step away with it for the long term 
there's lots of work ongoing in that community. You know, you will have heard us talk about clear home build, and uh, that's clearing people out, people that cause people fear of harm. And um, that's really important now. We are still trying to make people that are causing fear and are toxic. We don't want them. They don't want them. We don't want them in the area. We want them out, either in jail or out of the area. Filling the vacuum that yeah. if an organised crime group is taken out by a police operation, that's then about stabilising the area and ensuring that no other group takes their place. And then the more difficult task, I suppose, is building up the community to prevent organised crime taking root again. Definitely. Um, people don't want that. And that's what people have been telling us. They're sick of drug dealing, they're sick of people hanging around the streets, young kids being sucked in to deal drugs. You know, you heard from Thomas Cashman third hand when he was took the stand himself, how he said he was a drug dealer in the locality. It, it, almost as though it's an acceptable, acceptable occupation. You know, he said he wasn't a criminal, he didn't burgle houses. That clearly is not something people want in their communities. They don't, and they've been telling us it, because we spent the last nine months living and breathing and supporting and working around Dovecot. And they've had enough. Uh, and you know, we, we've seen your articles that you put out and the feedback that we've read in them. People have had enough. Uh, and we want to work with people, so any information that people can provide us that will assist us in taking these people out, please tell us. Just, just to take it back to the investigation, um, obviously Cashman was first arrested on, I think, was it the, the 4th of September, which yeah. was his, actually his birthday, as it turned out. Yeah. Um, what, was the, what was the piece of evidence that gave you the... or made you take that decision to make his arrest in the first instance? Was there a particular... Was, was, was there was something that came in that made you think, right, now we can actually progress to an arrest? Because that must have been quite a nerve-wracking and key stage to make to make that arrest when you when you got this this suspect. Yeah, I think June and I, we always thought long and hard about who we were arrested. It was such a high-profile case that um, to be arrested in connection with this offence, if you weren't involved, would, would be dreadful. However, uh, we got to a stage where we need to arrest him because uh, one, the community was saying it was him. Two, it allowed us to pursue, uh, to search his house, um, search his dresses, and that was really critical for us really because when we did arrest him on the floor, the address he gave us was his sister's address. Um, we went and searched that, and that gave us the clothing that we, that we now know that he changed into immediately after the shooting. Uh, and again, that further corroborated what the witness had said to us. So, it was a key decision yeah. during the course of the investigation, as long as we didn't say it lightly. Um, and we were also anxious that if we were arresting him, did we have sufficient evidence to charge? Because we also knew that that would cause anxiety back in the community if he was to be released. Yeah. But we did know at that stage um, that we probably didn't quite have enough. That's going to be the next question. What, what, were you, what did you feel you were missing after that first arrest um, to, to bring a charge? Um, we reached a stage where we were sat on a, a, a lot of material that we hadn't reviewed in terms of CCTV and we built quite a compelling case but the 4th of October was only a short period of time after the, sorry, yeah, after the initial shooting. It was too quick for us. And the 4th of September, sorry, is this? So 4th of September, I was going to say, yeah. Fourth of October, we'll be able to plenty of time then. Um, sorry, I think we had the clothing because he'd given us that address. We managed to go and get the clothing, which, as Mr. Baker has said, then corroborated what our witness had told us. But what we didn't have then was the forensics that had to be sent off for forensics. So all of this then started coming back after that date. The other thing is that's the opportunity on arrest for your suspect to obviously provide their account provide what they were doing if there's an alibi, that we can then go and pursue those like reasonable lines of inquiry to. Um, as you know, we never got that. Um, so there was nothing that we could, could pursue from that element of the investigation. But it was a question of we had things, but we were waiting for forensics. And that, that was huge, that really, around the GSR, wasn't it? Because um, Unfortunately, there was um, a, there was a almost like a national shortage, wasn't there, at that particular time? Mm. So we were fighting against other jobs that were going on in Mersey. It's a national sh uh, shortage of forensic in 
it, 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 it was around the GSR in particular at that time. It was just, just to explain to the, the listeners that GSR is a gunshot, gunshot residue, residue yeah. and, um, and two two specks of gunshot residue were found on the uh, tracksuit bottoms that's right. at, at Cashman's sister's address. Yes. Um, so and, and this is what we're talking about with, in terms and, uh, of testing. They were tracksuit bottoms that belonged to Paul Russell. Um, so um, there was um, there was a shortage of experts at that particular time. Um, as you know, Merseyside had a number of inquiries that were ongoing, so there was real competing demands. We were trying to prioritise our work and what made our job any more of a priority than somebody else's child or um, you know family member that had been murdered. And, and that was the difficulty that we were facing, and not just on Merseyside, but obviously the experts deal with jobs around the country. Um, but, you know, we had to negotiate where we could because, um, you know, we were talking about a nine-year-old girl in the safety of her own home. Um, so we did everything that we could um, to try and sort of get our job as a priority. Um, but with that, it still takes time. Um, and obviously forensics don't happen overnight. There's work that has to be done and things have to be opened up in a, a secure and a safe environment. Um, and it, it, it all takes time and that's what we were pretty much waiting for. So when we got the results back for, for the forensics, that was a, a real significant moment for us. Um, I think the other real significant moment was when, as you saw in court, where we initially thought it was potentially a bit of a, a recce where he goes out from the Mab Lane address and he does, as Mr McLachlan describes it, as the about turn. So this was um, th this was uh, a journey earlier that day um, where Cashman was seen walking towards the address where Joseph Nee had been earlier that day. At that point in the afternoon, I think it was around half past three, yeah. Joseph Nee had actually gone out, hadn't he? Uh, and, and on the CCTV, Cashman appears to look down the road, do an about turn and walk back in the direction he's come yeah. from. Um, that, that was huge for us um, as part of the investigation team, wasn't it? Um, it was a crucial piece. Um, because they'd come from the address, because we could follow him back, we wondered what he was going to say about that, how he was going to get round that. Um, we could see from the CCTV footage, from statements that we had, that Joseph Nee was no longer at that address, but it was apparent to us how Mr McLachlan delivered it in the fact that... And this is David McLachlan, the, uh, the, the, the case, prosecutor in the, in the case, yeah. <clears throat> so he had um, driven past the address on so many times, so many occasions, and at that particular time he's driven past in his van, he's seen Joseph Nee's van parked outside the address on Finch Lane, and within half an hour he's on foot. Um, we believe has gone round to another address on Snowbury to collect the guns. Um, and then has walked up, um, guns in his pockets, um, and he was ready to, to take um, Joseph Nee out um, had he seen him. <laughs>